Thanks for joining me here again at Preaching the Gospel That Saves, the station that is dedicated to our Apostle Paul's My Gospel, the Gospel of the Grace of God, the Gospel unto Salvation, right? And as we go to Romans um, chapter 5, verse 10. We take a look at what God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now, how are we saved today? Is it by the gospel of the kingdom? Is it by repenting and believing and getting water baptized, because Peter tells us that's for remission of sin. That is not to be complete in Christ. We do not know that we are complete in Christ until the Apostle Paul's been given the revelation of the mystery by the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. Now, we know that Paul's gospel is different from that of Peter, James, and John and the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry because Paul's my gospel was hid. Okay? And when Jesus was here on earth, when God was in the flesh, on the earth, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, before the cross, in the Old Testament, born under the law, Galatians 4, 4, of a woman, to confirm the promises of the fathers to the circumcision, Romans 15, 8, we know that he preached only the gospel of the kingdom, and that was to repent and be baptized for remission of sin, or repent and be baptized to inherit the kingdom. Okay, that is clearly not Paul's my gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel unto salvation, right? And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we know that Paul was not ashamed of it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So we know he went to the Jew first. And what Jew did he go to first? The uncircumcised Jew. And Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, 8, and 9 confirms that, okay? He was given the gospel of the uncircumcision. And he went to the Jew first with that gospel of the uncircumcision because that Jew rejected the gospel of the kingdom, okay? He did not go where Peter, James, and John went where they believed the gospel of the kingdom. The apostle Paul did not go anywhere near where the twelve had, or where the where Peter, James, and John preached the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, and that gospel that the Apostle Paul took to the Jew first, and then to the Greek, and then ultimately it's our gospel that saves us today, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is not the gospel of the kingdom. In verse 1 he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 2, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. And verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And Romans 10, 5 or Romans 5.10 confirms that we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son. And that death is Paul's my gospel, that He died for our sin, was buried, and rose again on the third day. If you trust that, if you believe that, your faith is counted for righteousness, and you are forgiven completely of all sin. Okay? It's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that forgives you of your sin. And when did He shed the blood? Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Okay, We know that it's not according to what John MacArthur believes about the blood, because... If we believe what he believes about the blood, then we're clearly 
not saved, okay? Because it's the blood, right? Ephesians 1, 7, that redeems us, in whom we have redemption through His blood, and then it also, from His blood, we have forgiveness of sins according to what? The riches of His grace. What was His grace? That He died for our sin, correct? Well, in if you look at Colossians 1, 14, that is another fantastic verse that confirms what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ does for all of us if we believe it. Okay? If we believe it. Okay? It's not universal salvation. We have to believe it. Um, Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Okay? And what does John MacArthur say about that? In his New King James Version, Study Bible and page 1,833, he says, Through his blood, a reference not limited to the fluid as if the blood had saving properties in its chemistry, but an expression pointing to the totality of Christ's atoning work as a sacrifice for sin. We know it's not an expression. We know it's his blood that forgives us of our sin. Okay. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, John MacArthur does not believe that. And he clearly tells us that in his study Bible. So, based on what Christ did for us on the cross, that he died for our sin, was buried, and rose again on the third day, we believe that, and our faith is counted for righteousness, Romans 4 or 5, and we have forgiveness of sin. Okay? We don't have to pray the Lord's Prayer and ask Him to forgive us our sin. And by the way, and I had mentioned this on some of my other messages, the Lord's Prayer does not contain forgive us our trespass. That is after the Lord's Prayer. Okay, The Roman Catholics put it into the Lord's Prayer and removed um, the verse that tells us about our debts that are against us. That's removed and they replace it with um, forgiving our trespasses, which is clearly after, it's the verse that comes after the Amen. But anyway, and again, like I said on my, one of my other uh, messages, we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer on another series that I'm going to put out that is going to cover R.C. Sproul's book on the Lord's Prayer. And you can clearly see, and it's unfortunate, that that gentleman does not understand his Bible. But anyway, as we continue to look at the words people attach themselves to that are clearly biblical, but as we have found out in part one about pastor and doctor, would you really want those names attached to yourself? Clearly, if you study it out, um, you might want to reconsider. Okay, Today we're going to look at Reverend, and you're going to find that interesting. We're going to look at Apostle, and then we are going to look at what I was called a flock leader, which is going to be really easy to look at because it's not in the Bible. So as we continue, we're going to start with reverent. Psalm 111.9 is the only verse that contains reverent, and this is what it says. In the King James Authorized Version, now if you have a new translation, and I did not look it up in the new translations, um, they, it might not even exist, or you might have ten verses. But in God's perfectly preserved word, there's only one verse that we are intended to have, that God intended um, to give us, and this is what it says. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. So reverend is clearly talking about God's name. Okay, Holy and reverend is his name. Wow. So how many people call themselves reverend? It's amazing to me, because clearly they don't read. Reverend refers to God's name. Do they think they're God? I mean, my pastor at Harvest Bible Chapel, Pastor Dr. James, Pastor Dr. Reverend James McDonald, claimed that God talked to him. Okay, this is no different than Benny Hinn. This is no different than the Apostle Prophet at KV Ministries. Look that one up at Bethel um, Ministries. 
people think God talks to them today um, out of a bush. I mean, that's how he talked to Moses. Did, does he appear to them? Because that's how he talked to the Apostle Paul and to the 12 disciples. I mean, how does he talk? Does he whisper? And, and that's another series we're going to cover, how God talks to us today. And it's clearly not vocal. Today, in the dispensation of the grace of God, God instructs us through his word. Okay? If it wasn't for his word today, we would not be saved. Okay? We understand the gospel, the grace of God, because of his word, because of the Holy Bible. Okay? Not because he talked to us. Because somebody told you, somebody preached it to you, and you believed it and trusts it, and now you're saved. That's how it works today. Okay? If God was talking to people, then why would I have to preach the gospel to you? I would just let God talk to you and you'll get saved. But that is not what the Bible says clearly. But anyway, we'll talk about that on another series. So, Reverend, if you look it up in the wiki definition, I just like to go on the wiki because the wiki's pretty, pretty hilarious. Um, it says, A title warranting great respect prefixed to the names of Christian clergy. Yeah, that's what it says in that verse, right? Because we go to God's perfectly preserved word for, for biblical definition. It's a built-in dictionary, right? And clearly it says Christian clergy, right? Back here in the Old Testament under the law in Psalm 111.9, where there was never ever one mention of any Christian. That didn't happen until Acts chapter 11 was the first mention of the word Christian. Okay, because a Christian is when, when the Lord Jesus Christ seals you because you believe the gospel of the grace of God, which was given to the Apostle Paul by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that is how someone becomes a Christian. Okay, No one became a Christian in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They became a disciple. Okay, There's a big difference. Words mean something. And we understand that on this um, site. And if you have a hard time with that, you need to study it out. Okay. The word Christian does not get man mentioned until Acts chapter 11 in Antioch. Okay, not in Alexandria, where all the corrupt translations come from, but in Antioch, where God's perfectly preserved word comes from. Okay, but anyway, um, clearly doesn't say anything about Christian clergy in Psalm 111.9 where we get definition. And two, a person who has earned the designation and is entitled to use it publicly to minister. So clearly this is a made-up definition. It's not biblical. It's not from God's perfectly preserved word. And clearly reverend means God. And in their definition, it doesn't say anything that it is referred to God's name. So clearly, Romans 3.4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And hey, you know what? I figured it out. This is why so many so-called Christians call themselves reverend. They believe the wiki encyclopedia and not God and his perfectly preserved word. I mean, it's clear. If you go on weddingministers.com, this is, this is a good one, you will find people who have claimed their name as gods. Some are female. Isn't that weird? But hey, you know what? You can look up some rock bands and there's some songs where they actually sing that God is female. Maybe, maybe they like that rock band too, you know. How about Reverend Rebecca D. Armstrong? Okay, you could call her at 888-80-RIGHTS. How about Reverend Daniel L. Harris? Or Reverend Roy Fry? Or Reverend Robert? Or Reverend Mary L. Gear? Or Reverend Mary Moeller? Wow, a reverend. That's the name of God attached to Mary. That's, that's good. How about Reverend Linda Jeske? Hey, her, she's got two different numbers. And as my pastor at Harvest Bible Chapel, he also used the word reverend, and he also used doctor and pastor. Wow. Clearly not a Bible believer. Clearly. Um, you know, if you attached one name, but all three, especially the word reverend, that refers to the name of God. How can you attach that to the front of your name? And there's only one verse in the Bible. How can you miss it? Clearly, they did not read it. 
I would I would definitely not take God's name and say it's mine, that's for sure. And let's look at another another name I will never use. And again, are you fully persuaded? Romans 14, 5. Hey, but maybe if I gave you a few bucks, you would attach it to your name, right? And hey, then you could get on this uh, website called WeddingMinisters.com. And then you can have Reverend Mary stand up at your wedding. And then she can make sure that when you're getting married, you know, maybe you're getting maybe you're a guy and you're getting married to another guy, and Reverend Mary's gonna marry you. <laughs> what a mess that would be, huh? Or better yet, you're getting married to a you're a you're a man and you're getting married to a female, and your Reverend Mary is going to marry you, but she never preaches the gospel, the grace of God, to make sure that you're saved, to make sure that you're equally yoked. Wow, that's awesome too. Think of all the marriages out there, and I know a few, where both people come together, man and woman, to get married, and the reverend never preaches the gospel, the grace of God to them, to make sure that they're saved, to make sure they're equally yoked. Because doesn't God make it clear that you need to be equally yoked when you get married? How many pastors, again that name, how many pastors out there make sure that when the couple's getting married, they're equally yoked? In order for a couple to be equally yoked, they have to be saved. Think of how many pastors out there, what they'll do is, is they'll put them through counseling to make sure that they have unconditional love or to make sure that they know how to serve one another but they never make sure that they're saved. Why? Because they don't understand the gospel, the grace of God. They don't understand the importance of making sure that the couple is equally yoked. Now let's take a look at the word apostle. There are 19 verses containing the word apostle. In the dispensation of the grace of God, according to the revelation of the mystery, we look at Acts 9.27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11.5 For I suppose I was not wit behind the very chiefest apostles. 2 Corinthians 12, 11. I am become a fool in glorying. I have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Ephesians 2, 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Romans 1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Romans 11.13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. 1 Corinthians 9.1, <clears throat> Excuse me. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? 1 Corinthians 9, 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Look at that. I mean, that's a great verse. The seal of his apostleship is getting people in Christ. <clears throat> Think about all those people out there that call them apostles. They call themselves apostles, and they don't even know the gospel of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. 2 Corinthians 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, and signs and wonders, and mighty deeds. Now remember, 1 and 2 Corinthians is still in the transitional book of Acts. So Paul talks a lot about signs and wonders because Israel's program is still going on. Okay, Because he's in the Acts period when he wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians. Okay, 
Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus our brother. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. And that hope is a noun. Okay. I had a DM one time that said that there is no hope in hope. It's pretty sad, huh? Roman Catholic that he was. 1 Timothy 2.7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1.11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Who's God's elect? It's not you. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's Israel. Okay, Those are the two elect, the only elect in your Bible. Okay, It's never you. It's God's purpose. And the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, okay? According to the faith of God's elect, right? So the definition of an apostle, you're separate unto the gospel of Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, okay? You're the speaker of the Gentiles. You saw Jesus Christ. You're not of men. It's by the will of God. You're a preacher and a teacher, okay? It's according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, Okay? Not outside following him, but when Christ is in you. Okay? And Paul was behind the chiefest apostle, which is Christ. Okay? Hebrews 3.1 gives us definition. Also Ephesians 2.20 of who the chiefest apostle is. We go to the New Testament in Hebrews 3.1, which is clearly doctrine for Israel, for the Hebrews, for the Hebrew people. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Okay. First Peter 1.1 1, 1 gives us definition 2. Who's Peter? Well, he's a minister of the circumcision, right? Galatians 2.9. An apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered through Pontius and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And Second Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Definition, Christ was also an apostle and he was to the strangers scattered. Okay, In the Old Testament we find 59 verses containing the word apostles, plural. Okay, We're just going to go through a few. We're not going to go through all 59. And this is in the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is Old Testament, and this is what it says. Now the name, and that's on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, in, ca in case this is the first time you're listening to this. Okay? In case this is the first time you are listening to mid Acts, dispensational, Pauline, right division of our King James authorized version, God's perfectly preserved word. Okay? We rightly divide on this website. We are Pauline. That's where we stand in our Bible. That's where our worldview comes from. Out of the black letters, not the red. We know that the red letters is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ talking about Israel, about time past and ages to come. Not today. Okay. We are in the but now today, the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay. So we are going back to the Old Testament under the law where the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry was to confirm the promises of the fathers. Romans 15, 8, and Galatians 4, 4 confirms that. Now, Matthew 10, 2, now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, and then it goes on in verse 
3, but I did not include verse 3. And then, because I'm only including the verses with the name Apostles. And then Luke 6, 13, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named Apostles. So clearly, the 12 disciples are also the Apostles. Okay. And we get definition right there in Luke 6, 13, in case you're wondering who the apostles are, right? Well, it's the 12, okay? There, there weren't 13 apostles. Um, if you had all the people that say they're apostles today, that would make, you know, a hundred and something or a thousand and something apostles, okay? There's only 12 in the Bible, okay? And when the apostle Paul becomes an apostle, he replaces one of the 12. Okay, so it always makes the number 12. Okay. I know that's difficult to get in your brain, but there's no more than 12 apostles in your Bible. Okay. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. Luke 17, 5. So why anybody would call themselves an apostle again? That would make 13. Okay. Or more. And now we go to the New Testament which is after the death, burial, and resurrection on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 18. We go to Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 5. And Revelation 21, which is clearly after Jesus Christ, according to the Revelation of the Mystery. Okay, This is after, Revelation is after the church, the body of Christ, meets the Lord in the air. Okay, And by the way, we are not to look for Jesus Christ's second coming on earth. We are to look for Jesus coming in the air. Okay, that's what we're looking for today, our blessed hope in the air. Okay, and we're going to meet him in the air. Okay. Then once the church, the body of Christ is gone, then the Lord Jesus Christ comes back the second time for Israel. Okay. If you look at your Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back more than twice. Okay, you can count at least seven times he came back. But if you want to use the word second coming, which... Again, isn't in your Bible, but the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is for Israel, okay, not for the church, the body of Christ. So we go to Acts chapter 2, which is New Testament. It's after the death, burial, and resurrection on the authority of Hebrews 9, 15 through 18. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And again, that's that early part of Acts where Israel's program is still full go, okay? The dispensation of the grace of God has not been given to the Apostle Paul. He's still Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 2, okay? In Acts 5, same thing in Acts chapter 5, okay? It's still signs and wonders for Israel. Peter's preaching the guilt of the cross, okay? We're in the time of Jacob's trouble. We're in Daniel's 70th week, and it's clearly going to be the end of Israel, okay? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Hey, that's, that's good if you want to spiritualize that for us today. That, that works. And then Revelation 21, 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And this is fantastic about the, the 12 apostles. Okay, Revelation 21, 14. Clearly after the church, the body of Christ is gone. And the wall of the city... And by the way, that city is New Jerusalem, and it has not come down from heaven yet. Okay, so if you think you're building a kingdom, then maybe it came down and it's in your backyard. I don't know. Maybe it's behind the White House somewhere. I don't know. Um, maybe you guys know where New Jerusalem is if you're building a kingdom, because that has not come down yet. And by the way, another reference for New Jerusalem is the bride. Okay. And on that bride, and in the wall of the city, has 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which is what? 12 disciples, right? Wow. So the definition is that there was 12, okay? They had little faith, all right? They performed signs and wonders, and we know that the signs and wonders are for the Jew, right? 1 Corinthians 1.22 confirms that. For the Jews require a sign. We get definition according to the revelation of the mystery. We get definition from Pauline truth. Okay. Uh, they caused fear in people. They obeyed man. And their names are written in the 12 foundations. So clearly right there, if, you're, if the person leading your congregation is calling himself an apostle, ask him where his name is written in the 12 foundations. 
okay? What pastors call themselves apostles? Clearly they are distinct. We also know, according to Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel is shut down, okay? That would include Israel's program of signs and wonders, pastors, prophecy, healing, prophets, tongue-talking, water baptism, and tithing. This all has to do with Israel, and they are fallen and diminished. Looks like I'm not going to call myself an apostle. Don't listen to me, though, okay? You need to be fully persuaded in your own mind, Romans 14, 5. So what about these ministries <clears throat> that attach the name Apostle onto their um, agenda, right? How about Impact Apostolic Ministries with Prophet Pastor K.J. Miller and Apostle Dr. Mary I. McMiller? I mean, look that one up. That's a big ouch. And how about KV Ministries? This is a ministry that one of my friends at my old at Harvest Bible Chapel gave me when I was learning dispensational theology. Okay, He had given me, and I had spoken truth to him and given him different resources. And, um, and then I thought maybe he was getting it. You know, I thought maybe he... Uh, because he had left Harvest himself. But he left Harvest not because of doctrinal issues. He left Harvest because of the way they handled finances and, and you know, the reason that there's $65 million in debt and blah, blah, blah. But the reason why there's $65 million in debt is because they don't teach the Bible. I mean, it's not hard, you know. But anyway... He gave me these minist this ministry called KV Ministries, and this is what it says when you go and look at their website. And when he gave me um, this ministry, after I had spoken to him for a good year and gone back and forth with different questions he had and stuff, um, and, you know, by the way, the, the year's time, it was, you know, every couple months I would talk to him. It wasn't like a, a daily thing, but he gives me this ministry, and I just thought, my gosh, he just does not get it. He he still thinks the prophecy program is going on. He still thinks signs and wonders are going on. Tongue talking is going on, and and you know, I guess there's just certain churches that get blessed with these gifts, right? But that's not the case if you understand Romans nine, ten, and eleven that Israel is completely shut down. And we're in the dispensation of the grace of God, we're, and we were never under any covenant. And with all that in place, just the very fact that the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus Christ dies on the cross, just that very fact, that Bible truth, when you look at all the ministries that don't even follow that, it's no surprise that people can't understand what dispensation we're in. People cannot understand what time we are in in the Bible. They've been taught wrong for so many years. And, I mean, even when you turn on Christian radio, the, the teaching is, the, the rampant teaching is just, it's just wrong. Just that simple truth, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 18, the New Testament does not come in until the death of the testator. That simple truth, Ask any pastor, any denomination, non-denominational teacher why they call themselves New Testament Christians or why they call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John New Testament before the death of Jesus Christ. Ask them why they do that, because it's wrong. And all, most all scholars and most all pastors out there today that aren't dispensational, that aren't King James, that are not Pauline, that are not dispensational, tell you that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is New Testament before the cross. And that's where they're all hanging out. And the truth of the matter is, is it's Old Testament if you believe your Bible. So if you believe your Bible and, and in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel is fallen and diminished and shut down 
Because if they were not, we would not have salvation. Romans 11.11. 11. Okay? But yet, you have ministries that call themselves apostle, prophet, doctor, pastor. Okay? And don't understand that the sign gifts of some would be apostles, some would be prophets, are shut down. Anyway, this is what it says on KV Ministries. Chris is the senior associate leader of Bethel Church in Redding, California. He is called as a prophet and has served on Bill Johnson's apostolic team for decades. Decades. So he's been teaching things wrong for decades. I mean, how sad is that? He has written several books that people actually buy, okay, including the best-selling Supernatural Ways of Royalty, Chris's, Chris Volatin's prophetic insight and humorous delivery make him a much sought-after international conference speaker, sought-after. His personal testimony, and this is good, of deliverance from fear and torment brings hope and freedom to thousands. His personal testimony brings hope and freedom to thousands. I mean, that can't be the biggest heresy that I've ever heard. Who brings hope and freedom to thousands? This guy says he does. What about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Doesn't he bring hope and freedom to thousands? Not this guy. This guy doesn't give any glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. His personal testimony of deliverance from fear and torment brings hope and freedom to thousands. That is just downright heretical and sad. And again, just more people are not Bible believers. And they do not rightly divide. This is just their paycheck. Okay, I can go through a document with you of 30 pastors, okay, they don't admit, they don't give their names, but 30 pastors who admit they don't believe in God, it's just a job, it's just a paycheck. And that's probably, I'm going to maybe post, do a series on that one day. That is, when you're reading through that, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And one pastor had said, okay, and again, I... I would not use the word pastor, but one pastor said that a lot of pastors who know the truth won't speak the truth because they don't want to give up their income. How sad is that? So knowing what we just studied, we can show ourselves approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. And again, you guys, you know what? This is their issue. They have a brain they, God gave us a Bible that they can study, and they need to figure it out. They need to be a workman to show themselves approved unto God, right? 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It couldn't be any clearer, okay? If you're trusting in a translation, okay, and not the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15 does not say what it says. First of all, the word study is not in it. The word study is not in your NASB, it's not in your NIV, it's not in your ESV. So you would not know that you have to study. You would not know that God is commanding us to study because the commandments of God today are Paul's writings. Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, 37 confirms that. Okay, and in Paul's writings, what does he command us to do? He commands us to study to show thyself approved unto God. Who's doing that? Instead, you got... Prophet, Pastor K.J. Miller and Apostle Dr. Mary teaching that they're prophetic, you know, and that their personal testimony brings hope and freedom to thousands. That's what Chris says at KV Ministries, you know. Clearly not studying the show themselves approved unto God. Clearly, when you take the name of reverend, okay, and attach it to a female pastor, clearly they're not studying their Bible. Clearly, when you study the word doctor and you attach that to your name clearly they're not studying their bible because the doctors were of the pharisees of the law 
who had a reputation. Jesus Christ, Philippians 2, 7, had no reputation and he did not empty himself. Because when it says that he emptied himself, that is out of the Roman Catholic, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, corrupt minority text that a bunch of heretics wrote. And it's unfortunate that there are teachers and preachers out there who fell for that heresy, like John MacArthur and Pastor Richard Jordan, and they're teaching heretical kenosis theology. And it's sad. Okay? He took no reputation. Okay? Like I told you, if you're going to leave a legacy, tell people that they're not using a Bible. If you're going to leave a legacy, tell people that they shouldn't be standing in the red letters. If you're going to leave a legacy, tell people that the only way you're saved is Paul's my gospel without works. Okay? Start leaving your legacy today. Be an ambassador of reconciliation, a minister that teaches and preaches Paul's my gospel. And we'll see what kind of a legacy you leave. It's unbelievable. The teaching and the preaching that's out there that is just tickling the ears and making people feel good. And hey, that's why they have big churches and that's why they're just planting, you know, and they have a hundred churches planted with a bunch of false teachers teaching false doctrine and a false gospel. Hey, but that makes money. Now let's look at the key verse again in the dispensation of the grace of God according to the revelation of mystery about pastor. Okay, we're going back to the verse, Ephesians 4.11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Well, what are we to do today, right? Because in that verse, he says what? He says some evangelists and some teachers, right? He also includes apostles, prophets, and pastors, right? And then 2 Timothy 1.11 confirms what we are to do today. Wherefore, I am appointed a preacher, okay, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. So clearly a preacher and a teacher. We are to preach and teach in the dispensation of the grace of God. We, we got the definition of pastors, okay? We know the prophets, okay? The some apostles and some prophets, that's shut down. That's Israel's program. So clearly, we know what our instructions are today. We are ambassadors. We are ministers of reconciliation. And we are to preach and teach. And like I had said in some of my other messages, not share, okay? Nowhere in your Bible, in the King James Authorized Version, does it tell you to share anything. The word share is only attached to a plow in the Bible. Okay, We are to preach and teach. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, we are to preach and teach, and that's how I learned what I know. I found faithful men who teach, who are faithful to the Word of God, and they teach it, rightly divided, because that's what the Word of God says, from a Pauline stance, because that's where we're at in our Bible. We're in the bud now. We're in the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay, dispensationally, because that's a Bible word. It's found four times in God's perfectly preserved word. It has not been removed. It's been in there for over 400 years. Okay, and we have to have a Bible to believe what we teach. Okay. We can't have a translation that's updated every week, every month, every year, okay? I mean, the New American Standard translation, 
from one year to another was updated and they added 5,000 words and then another year they removed 4,000 words. I mean, that is God's perfectly preserved word. A translation that they manipulate? Okay, you have to be fully persuaded in your own mind. I'm not going to say that enough, right? So the last word we're going to cover, and this is the best, is flock. Flock leader, okay, is not in the Bible, but the word flock is, okay? And by the way, that's what I was called at Harvest Bible Chapel. I was a flock leader. I led, I want to say, four or five small groups, okay? Small groups, and that's something that we will never cover on this station unless I'm just going to blow the lid on it because it's such... It's just part of the heretical doctrine that they teach. Small groups is when a group of people gets together, say, on another night outside of Sunday, okay? And what they'll attach to that is is that you're doing life together, okay? Doing life together with a bunch of unsaved people who don't understand the gospel with clarity because in that small group setting that I was in for over eight years, not one person preached the gospel, okay? Not one person had a Bible, okay, not one person knew how to rightly divide, not one person was Pauline, and not one person was dispensational, okay, and when you are under the harvest umbrella, okay, you have a pastor that's teaching you there a little bit of Calvinism, a little bit of Arminianism, he was a Baptist, so we have that Baptist teaching for sure, because water baptism was the heart of the church, Every week he would tell us how many people were baptized on all the different camp campuses. He couldn't boast enough about our flesh and, and what we were doing. Boasted very little about what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing in, in Paul's writings. Very little. Very little about the new creature. Very little about being an ambassador. Very little about preaching the gospel of the grace of God. But when, we are, when you're in these small group settings, all you do is talk about your sin. All you do is talk about your flesh, and very few people come prepared, very few people do the studies, very few people, and when you're doing these studies, they pick studies like Joyce Meyer, John MacArthur, you know, all these apostate teachers that don't believe they have a Bible, that don't rightly divide, that are not Pauline, and... I mean, John MacArthur doesn't even believe the blood of Christ saves anybody, but yet they're pushing his material, and it, it's just sad. It's it's a sad setting. It's a sad. Um, no doctrine is getting installed into anybody's inner man, and nobody's going to be able to overcome their flesh at 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 these churches in these settings, because they're not Bible believers. And again, Second um, Second Thessalonians. 213 confirms that if you're not getting the right doctrine in you because you don't well you don't have a Bible um, God's not going to work effectually in you okay you need a Bible for God to work effectually in you and you have to believe it and if you don't okay and you're in these small group settings which by the way is no different than an NA setting or an AA setting where you're sitting there and you know you're believing in your higher power and all you're doing is talking about your old man your your sinful deeds of the flesh and they're not telling you in that setting that your old man's been crucified and that's the problem with these small group settings and I was a leader over that and when I look back you know I'm a sh I'm just, I just can't believe how misled I was. And again, when you look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, oh, I'm sorry, it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, okay? And that is right there, your small group setting. The small group setting is the word of men, 
okay? Because for one, you're using, you're not using a Bible, you're using the Roman Catholic text, okay? That's what all those new translations are. You're using a Roman Catholic text, and when you're in this small group setting, okay, because, you know, I'm, I'm this flock leader of this small, because they're my sheep, okay? That's, that's, you know, I was clearly Israel. I was clearly shepherding my sheep, which is just totally wrong doctrine for today in the dispensation of the grace of God. But so as I'm shepherding my sheep, everyone's in the small group setting with a different translation. How can you shepherd sheep? Okay, well, for, for one thing, you can't because we're not in that dispensation. But if we were in that dispensation, how could you shepherd sheep when no one has a Bible? Okay, they all have different translations that say different things. There's no final authority in that setting. Okay, so when you have no final authority, ultimately, whoever you're under is the final authority, and that would be Harvest Bible Chapel. Okay, and that is one reason why you need to get out of that setting. Because if they don't have a Bible they believe, then there's no final authority. Only them. Okay? And... If you believe something different than what that denominational, non-denominational church thinks, they baptized you in and became a member, they're going to kick you out. Okay? I left before they kicked me out because of wrong doctrine. So, like I had said in this verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So if you believe this word of God, the King James Authorized Version, it will work effectually in you because you believe it. Okay? Not because you're in a small group setting. Okay? That is not going to get anything done. Neither will your AA setting or your NA setting. It's all the same. Okay, if you have never been in NA or or Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're in a small group setting, I would go visit some of those groups, and see for yourself that it's the same thing. So there are 99 verses, and by the way, the shepherd of the flock is okay. The shepherd of the flock is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Israel's Messiah. Okay? The flock is Israel, and Jesus Christ is the shepherd. Okay? So again, I'm not no flock leader. I'm not Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm not one of the pastors in the Old Testament. Clearly, I would not want to be. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a reverend. And I am not an apostle. And I am clearly not a flock leader. And by the way, when you look up flock, the definition, like I said, there's 99 verses. This is, this is a little bit of the definition I got out of the 99 verses. For one, they're animals. Two, um, typically they were, you would take um, your best sacrificial animal out of your flock. Three, it also pertains to Israel. Four, it pertains to Peter's remnant. Five, it, it pertains to um, tribulation Israel. Six, it pertains to scattered and sca the scattered Israel. And seven, um, the flock is who inherits the kingdom. Okay? So again, flock leader, not in the Bible. And... Um, clearly not pertaining to us, the new creature, the ambassador, the minister of reconciliation, in this, the dispensation of the grace of God, according to Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25. Thanks again for listening. Again, study it out for yourself. You need to be fully persuaded in your own mind, Romans 14, 5, as to what the Bible says. Because why? Because you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for yourself before Him. And Romans 14.12 confirms that. 
So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Okay? Thanks again for listening. Email me at buttnowministry at gmail.com and subscribe to my channel. Thanks again.